Thank you. Uh, we're going to keep the, inter the uh, session pretty interactive. So if you have any questions, uh, just interject and we'll address them right away. There will be some questions rolling through and some clinical scenarios to, uh, for us to talk to. And again, that discussion can be pretty interactive if you want. Um, we're going to start with an anatomical review, a pretty brief one since this is uh, directed mostly towards senior, uh, senior level trainees, so PGY 4s and 5s. So we're not going to go into too much detail, just the kind of details that are relevant for, um, for the surgeries that you'll be performing and assisting on. Talking a little bit about physiology, uh, and then we'll dive right into acute pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, and the complications of these uh, of these conditions and their surgical, with a specific focus on their surgical management. Uh, we'll be talking about pancreatic resections, their themes and their variations. We'll be talking about pancreas cancer. We'll be talking about cystic lesions of the pancreas as well as solid lesions of the pancreas, both uh, benign, premalignant, and malignant. Now, the pancreas has two embryological origins. One of them is from the dorsal bud, uh, and one of them is from the ventral bud. The ventral bud. Uh, finds its origin at the same place as the biliary primordium. And then between the sixth and the eighth week of gestation, it will rotate posteriorly to join with the dorsal uh, bud. And most of the pancreas, uh, the superior part of the head, the body and the tail arise from the dorsal bud and the inferior part of it, the inferior part of the head and the caudate arise from the ventral bud. And when these two systems don't, fuse, uh, you get what's called a pancreatic divism. A pancreatic divism occurs when the superior part of the pancreas, mainly the tail, the body, the superior part of the head, drains through an accessory uh, duct, an accessory papilla, and the lower part of the head and the uncus drain through, uh, through the main papilla, uh, through the worsening. Um, You'll find it quoted as a rare cause of pancreatitis, and that's really the, the key word here, is that it is a rare cause of pancreatitis. Almost 10% of the population has a divism, and they have no problems with it. So just having a divism in and of itself is not a pathologic uh, entity. Um, this embryological origin of the pancreas can lead to other, um, to other embryological uh, or congenital anomalies, including a, uh, an annular pancreas, which usually presents in childhood, as well as multiple, multiple uh, ectopic locations of the pancreas, including ectopia in the stomach, in mechosa reticuli, uh, et cetera. Uh, this is just an MRCP image that is showing you the divism. So you have the tail, the body, uh, the neck, and the upper part of the head of the pancreas that are draining through an accessory pancreatic duct. And you have the uh, lower part of the head and the uncus of the pancreas, uh, so coming from the ventral bud, draining separately and joining up with the common bowel duct. The pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ. You have to enter the retroperitoneum to see it. Uh, and most of the time, the way that you're going to see it is by opening up the lesser sac and uh, by uh, amputating the gastrocolic momentum. Um, and in fact, the pancreas is one of the, because of this location in the retroperitoneum, it was one of the last organs to be discovered. So Galen knew what the stomach, knew what the pancreas was, knew of its origin, but they didn't think that it played any physiological roles. They thought its exclusive role was to just cushion the mesenteric vessels. And in fact, the Arabs believed that as well. Uh, medieval Arab physicians did not ever comment on any pathologies of the pancreas, didn't think that it was physiologically relevant. They thought it was just a cushion of the mesenteric vessels. And you can't blame them for thinking that when you look at its anatomical relationship to the surrounding vessels. Um, this is really the surgical core. Uh, this is the nexus of all the gastrointestinal systems and the, um, the vascular systems that feed and drain the, the gut. Um, and these anatomical relationships are critical to understand for the safe conduct of uh, pancreatic surgery. There are important anatomical vascular relationships. Um, the common hepatic artery courses superiorly to the neck of the pancreas, gives rise to the gastroduodenal artery, which has to be amputated whenever you're resecting the head of the pancreas. Um, there are also multiple variations of the hepatic arterial anatomy. And even though they're not the purpose of this talk, they are relevant to 
uh, to the conduct of a Whipple procedure, for example. If you have an aberrant uh, right hepatic artery that would typically course behind the portal vein, um, and if you're doing a Whipple and you're not aware of the presence of such an ab aberrant vessel, you might amputate that vessel when you're trying to amputate the common bowel duct usually uh, with disastrous consequences. Um, pathological conditions of this arterial blood supply, for example, a stenosis of the celiac artery with retrograde flow through the gastrointestinal artery is something that you also have to be aware of if you're considering a Whipple procedure. And that's usually something that I'm sure you've seen your attendings test for in the operating room. They put a clamp on the gastrointestinal artery, make sure that you have preserved flow in the hepatic artery before amputating the gastrointestinal artery and proceeding with the Whipple. Uh, if you have retrograde flow through the gastrointestinal artery, usually that indicates that you have a stenosis at the celiac artery and the flow is uh, collateralizing or retrograding through the gastrointestinal artery. You, unless you address that in one way or another, you cannot proceed with your Whipple. Otherwise, you'd be depriving the liver, specifically the biliary circulation of arterial uh, supply. The splenic artery courses on the superior aspect of the tail uh, of the body and the tail of the pancreas. The superior mesenteric artery, of course, arises above the left renal vein and then courses behind the pancreas, emerging inferiorly into the root of the mesentery. And of course, the portal vein, the splenic vein, and the confluence with the superior mesenteric vein, as well as the IMV, are all joining up, usually around the neck of the pancreas. Again, in a variety of different configurations, which you have to know um, before you're going to the operating room. Where's the inferior mesenteric vein? plugging into this confluence? Is it plugging into the splenic vein the way that it usually does? Is it coming into the, uh, the confluence with the SMV or even perhaps lower down into the SMV? And all of these relationships and their variations are important in designing uh, pancreatic surgery, especially if you're entertaining a venous reconstruction. Uh, very often, these procedures start with a wide cocorization. Again, the, the, the head of the pancreas and the pancreas itself is retroperitoneal and part of mobilizing it is performing this wide coca maneuver. This is usually what will give you exposure to the superior mesenteric artery posteriorly. Uh, and it does help to mobilize some of the right colon to obtain that exposure as well. Most of what we'll be talking about today is the exocrine pancreas. The, the pancreas is actually two organs fused in one, the exocrine pancreas and the, en and the endocrine pancreas, which we'll be talking about a bit later uh, in the session. The exocrine pancreas has, is a, essentially a collection of acini that are uh, excreting pancreatic secretions into a pancreatic ductal epithelial network. These acini synthesize and excrete pancreatic enzymes, but they also uh, synthesize and excrete bicarbonate, which is important. Um, these enzymes are stored within small vesicles with a trypsin inhibitor and then excreted in response to uh, neurohormonal stimulation that is secreted um, in response to the presence of peptides and fat in the proximal duodenum. You see CCK and secrete and are what modulates these. Uh, that's where you can have mutations in the gene for trypsin inhibitors, SPINK1, that can cause chronic pancreatitis by essentially uh, predisposing to premature activation of the pancreatic enzymes within the vesicles in the SNI and starting a cascade of inflammatory response that leads to chronic pancreatitis. We'll talk about that a bit later. Let's talk a little bit about acute pancreatitis. Um, before we go into that, any questions about anatomy? I, this was kind of a very surface level uh, review. We can talk for hours about pancreatic anatomy. Um, if there's no questions, we'll just go ahead. Uh, the exact mechanism of acute pancreatitis is unknown. We think it has something to do with premature activation of pancreatic enzyme via Sinai, and this can arise uh, due to a variety of causes. Globally, uh, certainly in North America, alcohol and gallstones are the most common cause of acute pancreatitis. They cause about 80% of uh, acute pancreatitis. Uh, and then depending on the locale, the next uh, most common cause is either iatrogenic or trauma. Um, and these are going to be uh, the iatrogenic uh, episodes of pancreatitis are most commonly caused by ERCPs. 5% of ERCPs lead to a clinically relevant pancreatitis, uh, and that's not, not, not negligible. Um, and then 
the differential diagnosis for the cause of pancreatitis is extremely broad. Anything from uh, trauma to anything that could obstruct the pancreatic duct from uh, congenital issues. We discussed uh, pancreas divism and other congenital conditions, uh, malignant and pre-malignant uh, causes of pancreatic ductal obstruction, uh, autoimmune causes, which we'll get into a little bit uh, further down, as well as genetic, uh, genetic causes or genetic predisposing factors as well. Metabolic causes, hypertalcemia, dyslipidemia, uh, and pharmacologic and toxins. There's a variety of pharmacologic agents that have been associated with pancreatitis, anything from antibiotics to corticosteroids uh, to biological agents. Uh, um, you know, the list is really endless. Um, the definition um, of pancreatitis is defined by the Atlanta criteria, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but essentially calls for completing two out of three um, diagnostic criteria, them being pain that is consistent with the diagnosis of, chronic, of acute pancreatitis. This is a pain that is typically epigastric, that radiates into the back, that can be sometimes alleviated by certain body positions, specifically lying forward. Um, radiologic signs of pancreatitis, so pancreatitis that, that is diagnosed on a CT scan, on an ultrasound, or on an MRI. And finally, biochemical evidence of pancreatitis, specifically with amylasemia. The Atlanta criteria, which were originally devised in the 90s and revised in the uh, early 20 teens, um, divide pancreas into two broad categories. And these categories are important for you to know as clinicians and to understand and to kind of be able to place your patients in these two broad categories because the natural history of the disease is going to be very different. And the first category is that of an interstitial edematous pancreatitis. That's when you have acute inflammation of the pancreatic parenchyma and the peripancreatic tissues, but really without any significant distortion of the pancreatic parenchyma or tissue necrosis specifically. The entirety of the pancreatic parenchyma enhances normally with intravenous contrast agents, um, and there's no necrosis. This is a slide that's uh, issued directly from the Atlanta uh, criteria. Um, the second category is necrotizing pancreatitis. And that, of course, is a second tier of complications with the natural history that ends up being very different. Uh, and it, on the CT scan of someone with necrotizing pancreatitis, you um, will see areas of necrosis, meaning areas of hypoenhancement where there's no uptake of contrast, dead pancreas, essentially. Um, you have to be a little bit careful committing someone to one course or, or the other very early in their course, saying, oh, this person definitely has a interstitial edematous pancreatitis and they don't have necrosis. Because if you capture patients very early in the course of their disease, uh, the full clinical severity may not have declared itself. So if you scan someone the minute that they get into the, your emergency room, you may not appreciate the fact that they are actually in the early phases of developing necrosis. If you rescan them you know, in five or six days, then you'll see the full extent of, uh, of the severity of the event. Just before we move on, uh, Dr. Jad, there's a question from Ghazal. She's asking, does congenital and genetic causes lead to acute or chronic pancreatitis? Is there any yeah, relationship? That's a, good question. that's a good question. They typically lead to chronic pancreatitis, and, and we'll talk about that later. So the, some of the, the genetic uh, mutations aren't causing recurrent acute pancreatitis. They're usually causing chronic pancreatitis, so specifically STINK1 mutations and PSS1 mutations. That being said, you can have some variants of certain genes that don't in and of themselves cause any troubles, but that predispose you to developing uh, episodes of acute pancreatitis in response to certain triggers. And the typical example is that of tropical pancreatitis or so-called tropical pancreatitis, where there may be certain specific mutations that predispose you to developing episodes of acute pancreatitis in response to certain foods, specifically cassava uh, or cassava flour. So uh, for the most part, these are ge genetic mutations that are leading to chronic pancreatitis, but there are cohorts of patients who are predisposed to developing episodes of acute pancreatitis in response to certain stimuli. Uh, but that's an important question because I think the distinction between acute and chronic pancreatitis is very much obfuscated in the minds of many, certainly of many patients. Uh, but also a, a surprising number of trainees um, who, especially in complicated acute pancreatitis, are starting to think, well, now that's just chronic pancreatitis, and it's not. And we'll, we'll explore that a little bit lower down. Um, 
the fluid connections that accompany these two categories uh, uh, are also not interchangeable. And that's why, again, if you know what kind of pancreatitis they have, they have interstitial edematous pancreatitis or necrotizing pancreatitis, then you'll be able to predict what kind of fluid connections they're having. In um, interstitial edematous pancreatitis, the early kinds of fluid collections that you're going to have are called acute peripancreatic fluid collections, sometimes abbreviated APFC. And then past the four-week time period, once these fluid collections have walled off and matured, uh, they become, uh, they become uh, a pancreatic pseudocyst, a collection of pancreatic fluid that may or may not be communicating with the pancreatic duct being fed into by, the, by a pancreatic duct, but that contains no... Uh, necro no necrotic material from the pancreas itself. As opposed to necrotizing pancreatitis, where earlier on you may have an acute, acute necrotic collection that after a certain number of weeks, usually four to six weeks, will mature into what we call WON or WON or walled off necrosis. And uh, so it's important to distinguish these entities from each other. Pancreatitis has an early phase and then it has a late phase. And the mortality that accompanies pancreatitis uh, follows this kind of bimodal, these bimodal phases. The early phase is characterized by an acute inflammatory response. And the patients that die in the early phase die from essentially overwhelming inflammation and overwhelming sepsis. In the late phases, you get local complications and that's what you're dealing with. And there's mortality there from sepsis, from infectious complications, sometimes hemorrhagic complications as well. Um, and again, that's not to say that the patients who are dealing with the late complications of acute pancreatitis have chronic pancreatitis. They don't. They are dealing with the sequelae of acute pancreatitis. So they have complicated acute pancreatitis. An ultrasound is recommended to rule out gallstones almost universally. You want to know if someone has gallstone pancreatitis because that does change things, not in the immediate phase, but eventually as to what needs to happen for this patient. But there's global agreement that a CT scan is the best imaging modality for acute pancreatitis. Again, with the caveat that we discussed earlier that you can't define the extent of necrosis in the first few days of the disease. So it's not really important to scan the patient as soon as they get to the hospital unless you're trying to rule out other pathologies uh, on the differential diagnosis. But it is important that that patient gets a CT scan at some point, somewhat early on, just so that you have an idea of what kind of, what kind of pancreatitis you're dealing with and what you should expect in terms of the life history of this patient. Uh, the Atlanta classification grades pancreatitis in grades of severity, mild, moderate, and severe, based on the presence of uh, synchronous organ injury. And uh, this also correlates with the presence of necrosis or, or not. So there are difficult, different tools that help you predict uh, the clinical severity of pancreatitis. These are the ransom criteria, which I'm sure you've all heard about. They're right there on the, on the screen. They are often on uh, on board exams, so you just should just know this by heart. Whether the Ransom score is actually used clinically very often is more debatable because you do need a 48-hour window for the Ransom score to be, to be calculated. You have to measure some laboratory markers at admission and then 48 hours later, and you have to purposefully send off some of these labs which are not necessarily universally sent, things like the calcium level um, or the blood urea nitrogen level. Apache 2 is also a good correlate for severity and is, is used more often. The only downside to it is that it is a proprietary algorithm. And the CRP is sometimes used as a, as a marker with a level of over 150 correlating with severe pancreatitis. The CT findings also correlate with the severity. Uh, there's a CT severity index, also known as the Balthazar score, uh, that assigns a certain number of scores to the presence of uh, you know, only inflammation, um, uh, a normal pancreas, so just a biochemical pancreatitis with no radiologic findings, uh, enlargement, so that's a, a B or a bulky pancreas, uh, and then getting into the presence of fluid collections and then with or without necrosis. The uh, degree of necrosis or the proportion of the percentage of necrosis of the pancreas correlates with the clinical severity as well. Um, and it also correlates with the likelihood of the patient progressing to an infected necrosis. The more necrotic pancreas you have, the more likely you are to have infected necrosis. Just before we move on, Dr. Jad, there's just two questions. 
Uh, one question from Abdul Aziz. He's asking, is there anatomic cause of, I'm assuming he's saying, uh, of pancreatitis that cannot, of, we cannot define in first few days? Is there an anatomic cause? If we cannot define, like, that's I'm not, the question. I'm not sure I understand. Um, I'm not sure I understand. And I, I think he's asking if there if there is a, a correlation of uh, anatomy with pancreatitis if the cause cannot be defined in the first few days. So if it's not gallstones or alcohol, can anatomy be a reason for pancreatitis? Uh, like an um, no, no. Essentially, no. There is no. Uh, yeah, no. You can't quite. You can't quite say if it's not alcohol or gallstones. You can't say, well, I haven't found the cause. It is more likely to be an anatomical cause. You still have to go through your entire differential diagnosis, do your metabolic workup, um, look, at, uh, you know, look at all of the other uh, reasons. Are there on any medications that are new? Do we have any infections? Uh, keep investigating, basically. Yeah. You have to go back and, to the and another question, what about serum amylase and lipase? Do we use them yeah. for diagnosis? Yeah, so that's the third criteria in the Atlanta classification. So you need an elevation in amylase or lipase. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's three times the upper limit of normal for it to be considered uh, an amylase. So you need two of the three criteria. You need pain that is consistent with a diagnosis of pancreatitis. Um, you need radiologic findings of pancreatitis. You need a biochemical amylasemia or lipasemia. You have two of these three factors, you have pancreatitis, mm -hmm. according to the Atlanta definition. There's another question, but I think it might be answered later. How to differentiate between pseudocysts and walled-off necrosis on imaging? And what are yeah, the findings? So, yeah, that's a good question. So the pseudocyst does not contain any necrotic material, right? Um, I think it says so like, very briefly here. Um, uh, yeah, you, you essentially don't have any ne necrotic pancreatic material within a pseudocyst. You just have an inflammatory, a wall that's made up of sloughed off inflammatory uh, fibrinopurulent material, uh, and then the contents are pancreatic fluid, as opposed to a walled off necrosis, which is a dead pancreas that has been walled off uh, by, by surrounding infl inflammatory response. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we're talking about treatment. Uh, so treatment of pancreatitis is supportive. Uh, we have no cure for pancreatitis. Um, so everything that we do is just supporting the patient and then dealing with the sequelae, with the local sequelae. Uh, some patients certainly need to go to the intensive care unit uh, if they are cl clinically unwell, if they have organ failure, if they have respiratory decompensation, etc. Uh, the critical points for everyone to know that are often on, on exams uh, and that are very important for you in your clinical practice as you're managing these patients is that early enteric nutrition is favored over parental nutrition. Your temptation is not to feed these patients and just give them TPN. That is the wrong thing to do. You have to feed these patients enterically. Um, big debate as to whether the feeds should be post-pyloric uh, in the jejunum, so an initial jejunal feed, or if they can just be in the stomach. At the Cochrane Review, there's really no uh, convincing benefit of one versus the other. So you just do what you can to feed this patient. There may be a benefit of immunonutrition, but the exact formulation is not known. Um, and so you just use what you have in your own hospital. Uh, the other thing that you should all know, uh, and that should be kind of standard everywhere, is that there's no role for antibiotics in the absence of infected necrosis. Uh, a patient with... Um, with pancreatitis will often have a fever, will often have a leukocytosis. But if you don't have any evidence that they have an infected necrosis or that you're dealing with another kind of infectious uh, complication, they don't need prophylactic antibiotics. Um, and then another thing that everyone should be aware of is that patients with a gallstone pancreatitis should have a cholecystectomy prior to discharge. Um, and that is the standard at the moment, is that the cholecystectomy should be done just prior to discharge. You know, when you're ready to send this patient home, they're totally fine, they're eating, uh, their vital signs have normalized, they're, uh, they're, they have normalized biochemically, but you would then operate on this patient just before they go home. Um, it may be acceptable to do an early cholecystectomy in patients with a very minor uh, episode of pancreatitis, 
Uh, that's what the Goldstone Pan trial suggests, um, but that is still not very clear from the data as to exactly who that patient may be. Uh, and so the most prudent thing probably remains to just do the cholecystectomy uh, at time of discharge. That's certainly our practice. Okay, treating the sequelae, specifically pseudocysts. Um, there's no interventions that are warranted for asymptomatic pseudocysts. Just because someone has a pseudocyst doesn't mean you need to do anything about it. You're really only addressing the symptoms that are being caused by the pseudocyst. And typically, these symptoms are early satiety, pain, gastric tract obstruction, you have a large pseudocyst in the endostat that is pressing on the stomach and the patient can't eat. That's a pseudocyst that you can do something about. And the way that you address these cysts is one of two ways, either through an endoscopic cyst gastrostomy or by a surgical treatment with a surgical cyst gastrostomy or a surgical, surgical uh, Rouen Y cyst jejunostomy if there's no close approximation between the lumen of the stomach and the cyst. And that is preferable over interventional radiological interventions that essentially commit the patient to a pancreatic fistula, a cutaneous pancreatic fistula. If there's infected necrosis, then you're dealing with it in a slightly different manner as well. Um, as we said, the degree of necrosis also correlates with the risk of this patient developing infected necrosis, and it's about a 30, 50, 70. If there's 30% of the pancreas that's necrosed, you have about a 30% chance you're gonna develop infected necrosis. It's about 50%, there's about a 50, 50 chance you're gonna have infected necrosis. If 70% or more of the pancreas is necrotic, then the risk of you developing infected necrosis is quite high. You should suspect infected necrosis if there's persistent leukocytosis or fever. But as we said, a lot of patients with pancreatitis have leukocytosis and fever. That just in and of itself doesn't justify you starting them on antibiotics. Um, unless this is the kind of situation where the patient has been there for you know, four weeks, their leukocytosis fevers are not improving and getting worse, they're clinically worsening. Um, the hallmarks of infection are a positive blood culture or a positive aspirate from uh, the necrosis itself and the presence of air in the necrosis. The presence of air in the necrosis doesn't completely indicate or doesn't exclusively indicate infection because it could be an indication of spontaneous fistulization with a hollow viscous, um, but that's an indication that that, that is a patient that should be on antibiotics. And typically the antibiotic of choice is gonna be a broad spectrum antibiotic, a carbapenem specifically, which we know has better penetration into pancreatic tissues uh, than other antibiotics. So that is the standard, and that should be your exam answer. Um, you should only intervene on walled-off necrosis. That's a very important point. You should resist operating early. Uh, even if someone is not doing well, uh, you know, they're three, four, five weeks uh, after their presentation, you should absolutely resist the urge of doing anything at all until the, until the necrosum has walled off completely. Uh, if you operate before that, uh, it can be quite, uh, quite tricky. And the treatment is again twofold, either endoscopic or surgical. The, the goal is ultimately the same. Uh, the goal is an necrosectomy to remove the dead material, uh, the infected dead material. Surgical necrosectomy is extremely morbid. It has a very high morbidity rate, and you should really reserve it only for the most in extremis uh, patients. Um, you're also essentially committing that patient also to a pancreatic cutaneous fistula, multiple drains, multiple reinterventions. Um, and there are also other options such as uh, uh, some less invasive options like a VARD, which stands for videoscopically assisted retroperitoneal dissection. And that's essentially when you start with a percutaneous drain, slowly upsize the drain over time to give you access into the cavity um, and then perform essentially a, uh, a laparoscopic uh, resection or use an laparoscopic instrument to pull out some of the necrosum from that cavity. And the most common complications at that point is a hemorrhagic complication. There may be other times when you are taking a patient with infected necrosis to the OR for another reason. So for example, they've developed uh, a compartment syndrome. You've taken them to the operating room for a decompressive laparotomy. That may also be a time to kind of uh, you know, do some debridement at the same time. This is often what you end up with, um, which seems like uh, something that will just make everything better, uh, but it often isn't. Um, and often these patients will struggle quite a bit in their recovery. Again, the mortality rate of doing something like this is about 30%. But there's different ways of doing these necrosectomies. You can open the lesser sac, 
drain out, uh, you know, remove whatever necrosis you can. And necrosis is typically just going to fracture off with your fingers. Um, you have to try not to be too aggressive with your necrostectomy at this point because you could easily uh, start getting into blood vessels and, and significant bleeding. Again, hemorrhagic complications are, are very common. So you just do a little bit. You leave wide local drainage and you get out of dodge. Now, very often, the lesser sac is not accessible in the way that it is shown in this picture because the stomach is completely fused to the anterior capsule of the pancreas. So you're stuck having to access the lesser sac or the pancreatic, or the pancreatic necrosis through other ways, such as by lifting the colon up and entering directly through the mesocolon or going in laterally. Uh, this is just an illustration of a VARD. So you have a chest tube, in, you have a drain in place. You slowly upsize that, uh, that drain to the size of a chest tube, 32 French chest tube, and then you do it through there. Uh, using a nephroscope and the laparoscopic grasper. And again, uh, you can see how problematic that can be if you start bleeding in a space like that, you really have no way of controlling it. So you have to be very gentle uh, with your necrosis. And there are patients, there are many, many patients who have died from a VAR necrosectomy um, gone awry, mostly from hemorrhagic complications. You know, you rupture the splenic artery this way and you cannot control that. Other complications of acute pancreatitis, pancreatic ascites and pancreatic pleural fistula. Uh, the treatment is usually drainage. You drain whatever cavity it's fistulizing to. If it's a pleural fistula, you drain the pleura, you put a chest tube in. If it's in the peritoneum, you put a peritoneal drain, and then you fast the patient with some parenteral support with or without octreotide. And then you may consider an ERCP and a sphincterotomy and stenting to try and divert as much of the pancreatic fluid uh, through the papilla to try and decrease uh, the uh, provide a path of least, res least resistance for the pancreatic secretions. Okay, first questions. Uh, patient undergoes an open necrostectomy, um, wide local drainage two weeks ago, and they've been having you know the regular kind of purulent necrosum uh, fluid coming out from their drains until this morning the fluid turned sanguinous. What is going to be the next best step? Should you kind of track that, pain, that drain back a little bit, thinking that maybe it's on a vessel or something? Do you just close clinical observation, just kind of wait and see? Do you do an upper endoscopy looking for an upper GI bleed? Uh, do you do an IR angioembolization? Do you go back to the operating room, find a bleeder, and put a suture in it? What do you want to do? We have, uh, as the attendees are answering, we have just a few questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, one is asking which microorganism mostly affects the pancreas? Yeah, that's a very good question. So they're enteric organisms. Uh, so they're going to be enteric flora and they get there by translocation. Perfect. And the next question is with regards to pseudocyst treatment, does the distance between the stomach and the pseudocyst play a role in deciding whether to go for endoscopic versus IR versus surgical drainage? Uh, that's right. So whether you're entertaining any kind of cyst gastrostomy, you need a level of approximation. It has to be close to the stomach. If not, you can't just bring them there uh, and suture them together. Uh, another option may be a cyst enterostomy. So as we said, um, voila. So either a cyst gastrostomy or a cyst uh, uh, wrong wise cyst jejunal. Oh, yeah. Bring up a rule limb, suture that limb to, uh, to there. And then if you can't do that, then, then you're stuck with a percutaneous approach, which is not ideal because then you've committed that patient to a percutaneous fistula. Perfect. Okay, so most people want to do clin close clinical observation. Um, and the answer is actually IR embolization. And it's actually IR embolization like stat, like right away. So that bleed is sometimes referred to as a sentinel bleed. It's giving you a little warning. There's a little red flashing warning that something is about something that things are about to get very real, very fast with this patient. Um, and here we are talking about um, uh, hemorrhagic complications of uh, uh, and the vascular complications, hemorrhagic complications of acute pancreatitis. And on, on the arterial side, of course, that is uh, pseudoaneurysms. That necrosin contains pancreatic enzymes. They eventually erode through the media of arterial blood vessels. You develop a pseudoaneurysm, and eventually that pseudoaneurysm pops. And the moment it does, you actually have very little time uh, because, as I said, things are going to get very real very fast. 
And if you're just kind of dilly dally and you're just waiting around and, oh, it's just a little bit of blood, uh, you know, it's just a couple of drops, uh, you've kind of lost the window of opportunity to act and save this patient's life. Another thing that can happen is that instead of that pseudoaneurysm popping into a drained pseudocyst uh, or into a drained uh, necrosum, uh, they can bleed into the substance of the pancreas. And what you get there is something called hemosuccus pancreaticus. You know, you scope the, they have a GI bleed, you scope them, there's blood coming out of the ampulla, that blood is coming from the pancreas, that's also coming from pseudoaneurysm, the treatment is also IR. So you have to have an urgent embolization for these patients. Thromboembolic disease on the venous side is also not uncommon. Uh, thrombosis of the splenic vein, of the superior mesenteric vein, the portal vein. And no invasive intervention is warranted here. There's a consideration of anticoagulation. And some of these patients eventually may develop some mitral hypertension, but you'll, you'll deal with that uh, eventually. They just have to survive this acute episode. Okay, let's talk quickly about chronic pancreatitis. Um, that's a completely different mechanism from acute pancreatitis. It also consists of inflammation and chronic fibrosis, but it's chronic uh, low levels of inflammation and fibrosis through the pancreas. There is also an association with chronic alcohol use as opposed to an association with alcohol in acute pancreatitis where it's typically like a binge drink that triggers the episode. Smoking is the most common risk factor uh, globally in the general population. And there are, as we said, some genetic risk factors, stink one GRSS1. And pain is a hallmark of chronic, hallmark of chronic pancreatitis and eventually leading down to endocrine and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And the pain has multiple causes within chronic pancreatitis. So sometimes you'll have pain that's caused by increased pressure within a duct. You have a structure, a stricture in the pancreatic duct. The upstream pancreatic duct dilates, fills with stones, and you get pain from that pressure buildup in the pancreatic duct. Alternatively, you could have pain from chronic fibrosis and remodeling that distorts the head of the pancreas to the point where the head of the pancreas itself, even though there's not much anatomical distortion of the duct, becomes a pacemaker of pain. And so when you're thinking about designing surgeries to treat chronic pancreatitis, uh, you want to try and understand in this specific patient, where is most of the pain coming from? Is it coming from a ductal issue with a dilated duct full of stones and, and pancreatic secretions? or is this anatomical distortion of the head and a pain pacemaker? Of course, the inflammation doesn't just affect the pancreas, it affects structures that are around the pancreas, specifically the bile duct, and patients can be jaundiced, or the duodenum, which can be distorted, causing gastric ductal obstruction and inability to eat. The treatment is, is not, for most patients, the treatment is not surgical. It's only a minority of patients with chronic pancreatitis that end up going to the OR for a surgery, um, so really the first thing you're going to do is symptom control. Uh, these patients have to be on a World Health Organization pain ladder that starts with NSAIDs and slowly progresses to opioids. Pancreatic enzyme supplementation is a critical part of that uh, because there's a role in decreasing feedback loops through the pancreas in terms of decreasing CCK and, uh, and, and stimulation of pancreatic secretions. In certain uh, circumstances, there is a role for endoscopic treatment. For example, someone who has a really proximal uh, stricture in the pancreatic duct, you could access that you could access by ERCP. You can put a stent across that, remove stones from the pancreatic head, uh, and treat them that way. And then, of course, surgical treatment, which is going to be guided by the local anatomy, specifically looking at a variety of things. Is there ductal dilatation? Is there jaundice? Is the duodenum involved? And is there a mass there that you're suspicious of and that needs to be addressed as well? Let's go into some of those surgeries a little bit. You may have heard of a pusto procedure. This consists of a lateral rouen y pancreatic digenostomy where you're essentially filleting open the pancreatic duct in the body and the neck of the pancreas and uh, suturing a rulim of jejunum to this flayed open uh, pancreatic duct. Obviously, it follows from that that this is a surgery that's going to be very good at controlling pain in patients who have a really big dilated pancreatic duct. But if that's not the anatomy of their chronic pancreatitis, then a pisto is not going to be helpful and may actually be dangerous because it'll be very difficult to find a very small pancreatic duct. Um, yeah, so obviously this is best for patients with dilated pancreatic duct, but who have no jaundice, no duodenal obstruction, a normal pancreatic head, that procedure can help them. 
A fry is a bit of a variation on that theme in that it uses a decompressive procedure for uh, the pancreatic duct, but it also cores out the head of the pancreas. And again, you're decompressing uh, the duct and then removing a small amount of the pancreatic head, but certainly you're leaving the pancreatic head behind and you're not usually touching the, the bile duct in a, in, a, in a fry, although sometimes you can. Um, sorry, this is, this is a bit of a taupo, but there are other, other procedures as well, which have kind of gone out of favor. And then finally, there's the Whipple. Uh, the Whipple is a good treatment for many patients because as HPV surgeons, we're quite familiar with how to do these procedures. And it is a combination of a decompressive procedure and a resectional procedure. It removes the head of the pancreas, the bile duct, the duodenum. So if there was a pacemaker there, or if there's a mass there that you're suspicious of, it's removed that. And it also gives you a pancreatic progestinostomy to drain out uh, the pancreatic duct. And it's going to be a really good option if the distal duct is not dilated. The main goal of these surgeries is to address pain. But most of these pains will redevelop pancreatitis. You don't stop the process just because you've removed the head of the pancreas or decompressed them. They're, they still have chronic pancreatitis. And so these patients must be dealt with in a multidisciplinary fashion. You don't stop exocrine or endocrine dysfunction. You might delay the onset of that, but you don't stop it. And all of these patients have an increased risk of pancreas cancer because of the chronic inflammation in the pancreatic parenchyma. And so there's a certain role for surveilling these patients on the long term. You don't just operate on them and, and then say, you know, sayonara, you're, you're good. You have to continue surveilling them because they are at a high risk of developing cancers in the future. And we're running a little bit over time, but uh, if there are some questions about chronic pancreatitis before we move on. There's this one question uh, saying, does ERCP work instead of lab coli in the case of biliary acute pancreatitis prior to discharge? So patient comes in, they just do an ERCP and gets discharged home. Yeah, so that's a very good question because you sometimes see people do that. There's actually no data to support that that is useful. The role of ERCP in biliary pancreatitis is limited to patients who have jaundice or have demonstrable choridocolithiasis. So just doing it, whether just doing an ERCP in someone who has acute biliary pancreatitis with no actual choridocolithiasis remnant, um, is not, uh, has never been proven to be efficacious. A lot of people will say, well, I'll do the ERCP and then I, I don't really have to do the cholecystectomy. And again, there's no data to suggest that. Uh, you may choose to go that route in a very elderly patient, perhaps in someone in who uh, a lab coli is simply not an option. Uh, you might take your chances mm -hmm. on that. You have to keep in mind that ERCP also causes pancreatitis like five percent of the time. So I mean, especially with the COVID area, we're trying uh, with the COVID era, we're trying to uh, um, decrease elective surgeries. So sometimes doing ERCP and sending patients home—that's what uh, most hospitals are doing right now in Kuwait. Yeah, I've uh, never seen a formal recommendation towards that, and I mean, an ERCP is also an area generating procedure. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. And uh, then reschedule them at a later date for the lab calling. Yeah, and um, um, that's something that is not unique to Kuwait. A lot of institutions do that. I've been in the US and Canada, and a lot of people say, oh, look, they've just got an ERCP. Obviously, the decision is easier if they have chloridocolithiasis, because then you say, oh, look, they got their centroidomy, they can wait, and I think they call bladder out next month or, or whatever. Um, and I mean, we know from the randomized trials of uh, the early versus delayed cholecystectomy that patients who have a delayed cholecystectomy will recur. And a significant proportion of them will recur. And we recur ne not necessarily with the same uh, degree of clinical severity. They may have a worse pancreatitis next time around. You may have missed the window or, or make your job easier. So. Mm -hmm. And just, we'll just take one more question. There's a couple of uh, other questions. Just, we'll just take one more question just uh, in sake of time. In case of uh, venous thromb thrombosis as a complication, any recommendations for the duration of the anticoagulant? And can we stop if follow CT showed resolution of the thrombus? Yeah, that's a very good question. So it's exceptionally rare that the CT scan shows resolution of the thrombus. Usually this patient will always have a thrombosis there. Um, and then whether you need to continue it beyond the three-month point, 
is really debatable, and I think depends to a great extent on on how much of their of their mesenteric outflow is is compromised. Um, you have to remember people can people can die from um, mesenteric venous insufficiency, right? I mean, we think of ischemic ischemic colitis or ischemic bowels as being really a consequence of uh, of arterial issues, but you know, you tie off someone's SMB uh, acutely, uh, they can have mesenteric ischemia. Um, mm -hmm. And very often in these contexts, they're able to collateralize. They collateralize through the IMV and through other things. But if the, uh, the level of the thrombosis is very high or many of the normal tributaries are also occluded, um, that's a problem. So is there like a time uh, duration for the anticoagulants usually? Yeah, there's no formal recommendation. We do three months and then we kind of play by ear based on each individual patient's mm -hmm. uh, like fall, risk fall, bleeding fall, bleeding risk, things like that. Perfect. Uh, we'll stop for questions now on sake of time. Uh, sorry, guys, but we'll ask the questions at a later time. All right. We're going to get right into pancreatic masses. Uh, the first Entity we're going to talk about is cystic neoplasms, sometimes abbreviated SCN. These are very rare entities. They constitute less than 1% of all pancreatic neoplasms. It's a true cyst, so it is not a suicide. It is lined with a cuboidal epithelium. Um, and they're often polycystic and sometimes referred to as a honeycomb pattern. They're sometimes referred to as microcystic, uh, but there actually are a not insignificant variant of them that is uh, macrocystic, that have large cysts. And that can make them more easy to confuse for other entities like a mucinous cystic neoplasm or bile type EMN. And we'll talk about these in a, bit, a little bit later. Just two weeks ago, we removed a, I removed a uh, cystic neoplasm thinking it was a mucinous cystic neoplasm. They're mostly asymptomatic, even at very large sizes. Uh, you know, uh, maybe a month ago, I saw this elderly woman who had a gigantic cystic neoplasm and she felt totally fine. This tumor occupied most of her right upper abdomen and she was totally okay because they grow very slowly and they don't occlude on anything. They don't cause jaundice typically um, uh, unless again at very like dramatic sizes. So they're mostly asymptomatic and in those contexts you should, you really don't need to operate on them, especially if you know with good certainty that they're serious cystic neoplasms. And sometimes that is the, the trouble. If you're not able to tell exactly what it is, you may have no choice but to remove it or to simply watch it. They do grow with time. Uh, it's a slow growth in the smaller cysts and the larger cysts grow a bit faster. Um, you can consider, it says, there are some recommendations you can consider resections of the larger ones, but to me, if you knew beyond any reasonable doubt that this was a cystic neoplasm, you don't need to remove this. Uh, there's an indication to remove them in the pediatric population, but again, we're just talking about adults here. Um, the argument there is that increased growth will likely lead to symptoms, but again, that's not universally true. Okay, question two. A 62-year-old female has lethargy, vague abdominal pain, fatigue. She has a 15-pound weight loss. Her blood work shows a normal white blood cell count. And a CT scan shows a bulky pancreas with an ill-defined nodule. Um, her pancreatic duct is not dilated. Her pancreatic duct is normal. So what do you guys want to do? Do you want to do a pancreatic colubinectomy? Do you want to start some chemotherapy and then restage her later on? Do you want to measure her serum IgG4? Do you want to do an EUS with a fine needle aspirate of the lesion of the pancreatic? EUS with FNA of the pancreatic. So I think the, the devil's in the details here because the D says EUS with FNA of the lesion of the pancreatic head. And had it said a core biopsy of the pancreatic head, the answer may have been different. But actually the answer here is measurement of an IgG4. And we'll talk a little bit about that, by why that is. So this patient has autoimmune pancreatitis, essentially. Uh, this is an autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic parenchyma. And it may mimic pancreatic adenocarcinoma radiologically and clinically. The symptoms vary. Uh, you can have jaundice, you can have pancreatitis, you can have pain, you can be asymptomatic, or you can just have progressive exocrine and endocrine dysfunction with weight loss, anorexia, and fatigue. And typically on imaging, you will find that there is a mass in the pancreas, but that is not very well defined. 
uh, it is not atypical to have what's called a sausage-shaped pancreas, where the tail of the pancreas is just bulky and filled out, and you've lost that fat that is kind of inter integrated normally throughout the duct. But typically, the pancreatic duct is not dilated. When you have pancreatic cancer, pancreatic cancer occludes the pancreatic duct, and you should have distal dilatation of the pancreatic duct. Uh, you don't have that with autoimmune pancreatitis, and that's one of the clues in this patient, in addition to the fact that the mass is described as being a little bit diffuse. And there's two types of biliary pancreatitis, of, uh, of autoimmune pancreatitis, essentially. There's type one, which is uh, an antibody, an IgG-mediated uh, destruction of the pancreatic parenchyma. Uh, these patients have an elevated IgG4 level, and it can affect other organs as well that are, that are within kind of the greater family of the biliary tree, of the pancreas and the biliary tree. So, you can have uh, an IgG4 cholangitis that comes with that, or IgG4 hepatitis, as well as some impacts on the salivary glands. And the type two is sometimes called the duct-centric one, is recognized on biopsy and is not core-mediated. You can't really make that diagnosis on, on an FNA. You really need a core biopsy to show you the anatomy and the plasma cell infiltration. Uh, and then you can stay it for IgG4 as well to know if it's type one or type two. The treatment is with steroids. Uh, and most people will resolve with steroids, although many patients will have a recurrence that can also be treated with steroids um, later on. And then you just basically give them a course of steroids, re-image them, and typically the, image, the imaging will normalize. 